have any idea it was going to take off like this? It's been 10 years, so actually it feel like um, it's, it's just an incremental thing, but mm -hmm. it, it, it certainly wildly exceeds yeah. any hope, hopes and dreams I ever had. Yeah. Okay. And, it, and, it's, and we're, we're actually getting started. Yeah, that's exciting. That's great. After 10 years. <laughs> we're getting started. You're watching Shelf Life. My name is Arlen Hess, and my guest today is David Hassler. David is the author of two books of poems, including Red Kimono, Yellow Barn, for which he was awarded the Ohio Poet of the Year, 2006. He is the author of several nonfiction books as well, most recently the play May 4th Voices, Kent State, 1970, based on the Kent State Shootings Oral History Project, published by the Kent State University Press in 2013. With photographer Gary Harwood, he is the author of Growing Season, The Life of a Migrant Community, which received the Ohio Anna Book Award, the Carter G. Woodson Honor Book Award, and was a finalist for the Great Lakes Book Award. He is co-editor with Maggie Anderson of two anthologies by the University of Iowa Press, Learning by Heart, Contemporary American Poetry About School, and After the Bell, Contemporary American Prose About School, as well as A Place to Grow, Voices and Images of Urban Gardeners. He received a BA from Cornell University and an MFA from Bowling Green State University. His poems have appeared in Prairie Schooner, The Sun, Double Take Points of Entry, Indiana Review, and other journals. Thank you for making the time to be here. <laughs> Thank you, Arlen. Great to see you um, it, again and to be here. It's exciting to talk about this book. Um, Speak a Powerful Magic is an anthology of poems that grew out of the Traveling Stanzas Poetry Project. Before we dive in, can you tell us a little bit about this project, when it started, um, how it's evolved? Sure. So it, most importantly, I feel in my bio, I'm the director of the Wick Poetry Center at Kent State University, which has been such a, a gift and a labor of love for me. Uh, Maggie Anderson, our founding director, brought me into the program in 2000 to, to develop an outreach mm. program. And in 2004, I became a full-time program and outreach director and I think at the heart of the WIC Poetry Center's work is a really robust uh, outreach program in our community, um, working with caregivers and patients, with veterans, with senior adults, um, with certainly children, grades K through 12. And in 2016, we were, we, were, we were awarded a major grant from the Knight Foundation to develop writing workshops with refugees and immigrants and um, to use poetry in English language learning classes as a way to help them learn English and to practice and make it an emotional and meaningful connection to right. their own lives. Yeah. Um, and so traveling stanzas, which started in 2009 when I received a phone call from a visual communication design professor, Valora Reniker. At Kent. At Kent State, mm -hmm. asking me, did I have any poems to give her students to, to design into beautiful posters? Uh, and to put up into the RTA mass transit system in yeah. Cleveland as, you know, inspired by poetry and motion. Sure, yeah, yeah. We thought, why not promote the voices in our own communities? Unlike, you know, Poetry in Motion, which is always featuring well-known poets, why not find and curate poems from our outreach work right. with children, with adults, with seniors, and in that way sort of reinforce the you know, the identity of our own community, that we use a phrase that poets are the means by which a place comes to know itself. Mm -hmm. And so through our traveling stanzas, uh, now throughout Cleveland, Akron, Kent, uh, folks see the voices in these beautiful posters. Now they're wrapped around metal utility boxes. Mm -hmm. They're on kiosks. We've developed a little audio button, 3D printed plastic case that you push and hear the voice of the child on the street corner uh, as, wow. as you see that traveling stanza uh, uh, on that metal 3D wrapped around a metal utility box. So it's really evolved since 2009, working with Valora Reniker and with many others to develop into a, a, a national project. So she came to you with the idea of taking these poems and illustrating them and making them graphic. Exactly, yeah. And, it's such a win-win opportunity because I think so many of our Kent State graphic design students, all of, you know, mm -hmm. all of these designs in this book were created by both undergraduate and graduate Kent State students mm -hmm. who are looking for meaningful ways to connect what they're learning to the community. Yeah. And then to see the reward, often they, that we'll, we'll have, we've had readings in bus stations where we 
launch a new set of posters and the poets meet the designers for the first time and they stand alongside each other and both talk about their creative process and the, dis and the sort of discoveries they made. And I think you know, part of the guiding principle of Traveling Sands is, is one, neither the, neither the design nor the poem has a kind of hi hierarchy over the other, that we're inviting the, the Kent State graphic design student to engage with that poem and, and make some visual work that um, speaks to them. Yeah. And, and then it's all kinds of happy accidents I, and I, discoveries happen. I like what you're saying about um, it sort of does away with the hierarchy. One yeah. of the things I think it's in either your introduction or in the foreword of the book that um, poetry is a great democratizer. Mm -hmm. um, do you find that the the greater community who is encountering these poems in public transportation and on utility poles are open in quantifiable ways to immigrants and children and poetry and literacy in ways maybe that they weren't before? Absolutely. I mean, we all have language, and therefore, even the way our brains work with, with synapses and, 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 and firing of dendrites, uh, we have the, the ability for a leaping thought. You know, a metaphor is simply, you know, as Robert Bly says, leaping thought. Mm -hmm. And to, to find, under those right circumstances, memorable language to capture a memory, a feeling, an emotion. And so through the uh, methodology that we use in our, in our community outreach workshops, we invite people into that space mm -hmm. to slow down, mm -hmm. to pause. The word stanza from Italian, it means a small room. So we think of traveling stanzas mm -hmm. as offering us little moments of pause or mm -hmm. pockets of time mm -hmm. to slow down, listen more deeply than we are used to, listening and listen to our own language and find that memorable way to capture some truth in our own life. Mm -hmm. And so we have poems in this book by U.S. Poet Laureates alongside a third grader, mm -hmm. alongside a veteran or a refugee. And that is a beautiful democratizing of voice. And I think it's an affirmation of that we all have a creativity, a potential for that creative thought inside of us, and we just need to learn how to access it and tap into it. Yeah. The community sees that then in a very real way in our kiosks. We have a poem by Jane Hirschfield on the Esplanade along Kent State alongside a fourth grade class poem. That's wonderful. And the, I have you know, mechanics. I take my car into a, into a shop in our town, and I had a, one day a mechanic walk out from the, inside the garage, he said, hey, you're the poet guy, aren't you? Uh, he goes, I, I like that poem about a tree down, down, down at the corner. I took my buddy to it, and we've played it a couple times. That's a cool poem. Oh, wow. So how do you, you know, rather than trying to convince people who have not experienced poetry mm -hmm. to come and buy a slim volume, you know, to buy a book, we want to publish these poems out in the community right. in unexpected places to bring poetry to people's everyday lives in, in ways that offer them opportunities to experience it. Right. Because published doesn't have to mean between two covers with a binding. It just means distributed to the public in some way. Absolutely. That's why people can publish online. It's not, publishing has, uh, publish has a wide def, broad definition. And I think when you hear a poem, it's published in the air. Right, exactly. And, uh, you know, we, we often find at, at the Wake Poetry Center that when we can get somebody to pause and to hear mm -hmm. a poem, you know, it completes that poem, the hearing, the deep listening. I think that for me, when I think about traveling stanzas, they are stanzas, like you said, that can, little poems that can go in my pocket and they yeah. can travel mm -hmm. with me. But once they're out in the world, they have their own lives. They travel um, from place to place, from person to person, and that's what connects person to person. Yeah. 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 Um, did the poets have any input into the illustrations that they're, that they're paired with? Not at all, and that's very intentional. So, you know, I think in some ways every creative act is, an act, is a gift. Mm -hmm. And so when you, when you make a poem, and, we, and we've, we've asked the poet in the community, or, you know, may we, may we select this poem and give it to a designer to make into a poster, um, then, it, then that designer receives that gift and makes something out of it that he or she, um, that, that speaks to them. We have had opportunities, though, where the designer will ask to meet with the poet in the process of designing mm -hmm. the poster. And in fact, that happened uh, with the poem Flags Are Flying. I arranged for Joe Steinhurst, who was 88 at the time, mm -hmm. to come to Kent from Cleveland and to meet Katie Barnes, uh, a graduate, uh, at the time an undergraduate Kent State student, 
who didn't understand an image in, in, Kate, mm -hmm, in, in mm -hmm. Joe's poem about gold stars. Yeah, tell the story because I th this is in the book and I enjoy, yeah. really like this piece. This so Joe, we spent many years offering writing workshops at Judson Manor, mm -hmm. uh, which is a, a retirement community in Cleveland. And she wrote a poem about her husband's brother who died in World War II. Mm -hmm. And the poem is called Flags Are Flying. And in it, she describes the tradition of putting up a white flag with a gold star in the window mm -hmm. uh, of a widow's home mm -hmm. when, 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 when somebody's lost right. their husband uh, in the war. Or their children. Or their children yeah. in the war, yeah. yeah. And uh, it's a beautiful poem called Flags Are Flying that was very meaningful to Joe. I mean, I think, and to her husband, hi. Mm -hmm. Um, and to her whole family. In fact, once she wrote it, she sent it, you know, to yeah. family uh, around the country. And she ended up just loved the image that, that Katie came up with for the... Um, Will you read it and then we'll show... Mm -hmm. um, yeah. We'll show it on camera? Yeah. But the story has a second half because there was a... Wasn't there a connection to... France, didn't they take So, overseas? you know, this is a beautiful example of, of traveling stanzas right. traveling far and beyond what, what any, who, you know, where any of us thought it might go. Mm -hmm. So it turns out that, that Joe's niece, uh, Paul, uh, Jean, mm -hmm. Jean Steinhurst Paul, is part of a network of, of World War II orphans. She lost her father uh, in 1944 when she was very young, so really did not get no, to know him. But this poem was so meaningful to her because it gave voice to this mm. feeling that, uh, this loss, and, mm. and it, it, it gave some shape and some form to it. Mm -hmm. She asked that we translate it into French, which another resident at Judson was a, had been a French teacher, oh. Robert Brooks, and he translated the poem into French because Jean often went on an, on a, on a, often to the Rhone American cemetery and war memorial in Draguignan, France. And she brought posters and cards of this poem translated into French and gave it to the mayor of the town, and who read it then at a ceremony, mm. the annual ceremony to commemorate the American uh, veterans buried in that cemetery. It's so beautiful. Let's take this one. Go ahead. This is the uh, yeah. poster and I'll read the poem Flags Are Flying by Joe Steinhurst, age 86 mm -hmm. at the time. Today flags are flying outside my window, 4th of July, and I am back in my parents' home, Boston, 1944. Flags were flying then, not all red, white, and blue, but white ones too, with gold stars to signify broken hearts. I remember when the telegram arrived just a piece of paper carrying tears for a wife, a fatherless child, parents in shock. Now, more than 60 years later, no telegram arrives, yet feelings remain for wasted lives untimely end, while once again, flags are flying. Most of the graphics um, of these poems, for example, are bold and beautiful. So this is what actually goes on the bus or it, on absolutely. The, the pole. We, we, we actually have a, a very extensive website now, travelingstanzas.com, where you can actually send these as greeting cards to people oh, around the world. Wow. But they're designed horizontally. They're, they're reformatted. Mage Reagan. Oh, that, that's yeah, a poem by Mage Reagan. Yeah. They're, they're, the yeah. reformatted yeah. both as horizontal posters mm. and then also to be wrapped around metal utility boxes. That's beautiful. That's really wonderful. Um, so translated into French, but I think there's a reference in the book also that some of the poems, six languages mm -hmm. have been target languages yeah. for these poems. What other languages and what were those circumstances? We brought uh, a, an exhibit of traveling stanzas to Florence, Italy for the Tuscan Anglo-American Festival. And we actually spent two years designing traveling stanza posters based on poems by Italian children in Italian. Kent State has a major Kent State Florence program. And we're now working on a new book, a bilingual book, of these poems written by Italian children and by Northeast Ohio children writing about home and belonging called I Hear the World Sing, Italian and American Children Joined in Poetry. 
That yeah. will come out in October 2019, so mm -hmm. I hope to come back. Oh, yeah, you're welcome to come back. No, <laughs> I can't wait. I can't wait to hear about that. Yeah. Now, um, you mentioned earlier the WIC program. So mm -hmm. this has grown out of the WIC Poetry Center. Mm -hmm. Can you give a little bit of background about WIC and what other programs they've got going on and that sure. Traveling Poetry Project has going on? So the WIC Poetry Center was founded in 1984 mm -hmm. uh, when two brothers, Bob and Walter WIC, um, created a scholarship program at the time in memory of their sons, mm. Stanley and Tom, who died tragically in car accidents as teenagers, mm. um, seven years apart on the same day. Oh, wow, I didn't and, know that. And um, Stanley was an avid writer, Bob's son, Stanley. Mm. And so at that time, they created the Stan and Tom Wick Poetry Prize. Um, in 1989, Maggie Anderson, our founding director, came to Kent State, hired to, as a, a faculty poet, mm -hmm. and she began to grow what was at that time a scholarship program mm -hmm. into a program. And she created uh, a reading series on campus. She worked with the Kent State Univers University Press and created the Stan and Tom Wick National Poetry Prize to publish a first book of poems, mm -hmm. and then that which then would be published by the press mm -hmm. and, and the Ohio Chapa Prize right. as well, and while continuing to give out scholarships to undergraduate students and to incoming freshmen. And I think you I did. were a scholarship <laughs> recipient. I, I was, yeah, my senior year. I yeah. was. That's what the first validation I ever had of my own writing. Wow. Came from that. Well, then in 2000, as the program continu continued to grow, and the Wick family loved the direction that it was going, mm -hmm. she, Maggie brought me in to develop a, a class, which I created on campus called Teaching Poetry in the Schools. And mm -hmm. it was a way of training Kent State students to go out into the community to lead writing workshops. That's wonderful. And that class has grown, and, and that's just, so has the outreach grown, yeah. Th that is such a tribute to the Wicks mm -hmm. and, um, and to their sons. I mean, to have lost their lives so young, but to have brought so much joy, you know, 30, 40 years later is really, yeah. is really lovely. Yeah. Um, okay, so let's see. Um, I think one of the things I wanted to ask you about as well is the size of the book. Mm -hmm. um, it feels oversized, mm -hmm. as opposed to a little poem you can stick in your pocket. You can't put mm -hmm. this book in your pocket. Yeah. And um, in that sense, it feels childlike, mm -hmm. which I think fits well with the connection to the children. Yeah. But there's a line um, in the foreword by Naomi Shihab Nye that says, a poem won't weigh you down, but it might lift you up. Mm. Was there a conscious effort to keep the book large and uplifting and something to always keep out on a table because yeah. you can't really put it into a bag? That's a great question. I, we're, we're, we're so thrilled that the Kent State University Press believed in this project and really ran with it mm -hmm. and wanted to invest in creating a book that was a work of art as well that would lay open on the table, mm -hmm. um, that would honor the, the quality of the, mm -hmm. of the graphic designs and of the poems and the unusualness of it. Um, again, w kind of breaking poetry out of its own echo chamber right. and finding poems in unexpected ways and, a and, and creating points of access to poems. And we often find that somebody who would not think of themselves as a poetry reader is attracted to the design yeah. and they walk closer and then suddenly they pause and all of a sudden they're reading a poem, yeah. maybe for the first time mm -hmm. in their life. And I think the book, the size of the book, kind of straddles a, a, how do you define it? It's not just a children's book. It's a, it, it, but it's not it, a coffee table book But it's not then. a coffee okay, table book. I didn't realize book. that was um, okay. and, and, and again, we very consciously have inside this book mm. well-known poets and U.S. poet laureates who have come to our campus or been judges for the Stan and Tom Wick Poetry Prize alongside a fifth grader, wow. alongside a refugee. Uh, will you read us a poem or two on the way out? Absolutely. Okay, that would be great. I'll let you choose. Oh, my. Well, I'm going to read a poem by Linda Zhao. Okay. Um, who wrote a poem called You and I, and this pointed us toward our title for the book. Um, the title, Speak a Powerful Magic, literally is a phrase inside a, a community poem we did with the College of Nursing at Kent State, and a poem we scripted called Some Days. Mm. Um, that's a great one. In which one of the undergraduate nursing students mm -hmm. says, my mouth can speak mm -hmm. a powerful magic. Um, 
But Linda Zhao, who grew up in China and came to the U.S. and left her grandmother there, uh, where, who, who raised her, wrote a poem honoring and remembering her grandmother called You and I, who she had not seen for years and who, and who has since passed away. And when we interviewed Linda to talk about the writing process and to ask her to read the poem for short little videos that we've created on our website, travelingstanzas.com, she said it, she started to tear up and she said, you know, I feel like my grandmother is but beside me when I read this poem. And then she turned to me and she said, these poems are magic. And I think we all have um, that ability to have the daily magic um, enter, however small, how, uh, in our lives through poetry and through, through all art. So this is a poem called You and I for My Grandmother by Linda Zhao. I am the growing grass, and you are the nurturing dew that kisses my blades in the morning. I am the underground tunnel, and you are the famous archaeologist that discovered me and brought me out of the dark. I am the compass needle, and you are the fully magnetic earth that spins me to point north. God, that's beautiful. Oh. Imagine that relationship. And when Linda read that poem mm -hmm. in the actual writing workshop where we were working in Akron at an e, a English language class mm -hmm. at the International Institute of Akron, it was like revelatory for her. She stood up and she proclaimed this poem mm -hmm. with tears in her eyes and a kind of a remarkable voice. Mm -hmm. um, I, I did not try to, to, to replicate it, mm -hmm. but... but it was, became her own manifesto, right. her own um, proclamation. Mm -hmm. And that was magic. Mm -hmm. She was speaking to powerful magic that day. I bet the room was just... We have found out. that we, we actually call it charging the air. Mm -hmm. You know, that when you come and bring in a model poem, you can charge the air with the thoughts and the language. And then people are drawing from that, the inspiration, which from Latin, inspire, means to breathe in. Mm -hmm. So they're pulling down, breathing in that charge. And everybody around the room, poetry became this way of making bridges mm. across people from nine different countries, all with the different mother tongues, mm. were, were building these bridges and connections with each other through, through the poems they wrote. We need more poetry in the world. We do. We need a lot more poetry. Okay, one more, and then we'll wrap up. Um, well, let me, read, um, let me read a poem then by... Um, by a third grade student at Holden Elementary School. Actually, um, yes, I will read um, then Thank You Tree by a oh, like fourth grader. Okay, so sweet. Um, because I think this poem also taught, uses that word spark. Mm -hmm. And how do we spark new meaning? Mm -hmm. um, we, we often talk at WIC about rubbing two words together in an unexpected way right. and creating a spark, a new spark of meaning. Yeah. So this poem was written by Fatou Mbaye in fifth grade, where she literally had, uh, it's called Thank You Tree, mm -hmm. and um, this became a way for her to honor, in this case, a, a tree that they called um, their friend. Mm -hmm. She and her, her girlfriends would hang around this one tree and they thought of it as another girl, oh, uh, their age. Mm -hmm. And um, it, I think it's, a, it's another example, you know, through poetry, we, 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 we make these connections and, and a, a deepen our sense of belonging, not only to each other, but to the world. Mm -hmm. um, Naomi Shihab Nye has mm -hmm. a beautiful quote about poetry is this conversation with ourselves, with language, and with the world. Mm -hmm. And so this is definitely a beautiful conversation Fatou has had with this tree. Mm -hmm. Thank you, tree. Tree, you put the spark back in my body. And when I take a breath, the lights behind my eyes are turned on and the fire in my furnace crackles. <laughs> the whole world stops buzzing. For once, the earth will have a chance to think and remember why, we're, why, we, why we are here. On that day, I'll look at you, tree, through your leaves, your bark, your sapwood, all the way to your heart, your beating, beating heart, and say thank you.
That's so lovely. Um, there was a line in, it might have been your introduction, about um, from Stanley Kunitz. Mm -hmm. He who has forgotten the child he was is already too old for poetry. Yeah. It's a great line. And I think that you know, the children certainly are in touch with the world in ways that, as an adult, I'm not always. Um, mm -hmm. But also the poets, that, the established poets that you've included mm -hmm. in there still have that childlike quality in mm -hmm. their poems. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you. It's been a wonderful conversation. Not all of it made it onto the camera. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you've been watching Shelf Life. My name is Arlen Hess. I'm with City Books. Our guest today has been David Hassler, the poetry guy, director of the Wick uh, Poetry Center at Kent State University. Shelf Life is a co-production of City Books and PCTV 21, located on the north side. If you'd like to follow City Books, our website is citybookspgh.com. And we're on all social media at CityBooksPGH. Thanks for watching. Um, so one of the ones that I had marked was that Mage Reagan one. I think that that um, the illustration with the heart. Um.